Hello. Hi, Rick. Hey, Rick. Okay, well, gentlemen, thank you um, for your interest in the uh, St. Joseph School District. We appreciate your time today. What we're going to do is just kind of go around and introduce ourselves so you can kind of become familiar. And then uh, I had mentioned to them that uh, you had a list of the questions. And so, and I also uh, just want to take this opportunity to thank you for your responsiveness and thank you for your professionalism throughout the, throughout the process. So we'll just start with LaTanya and kind of work around the room. Hello, I'm LaTanya Williams. Dave Foster, President of the Board. LaTanya Williams is Vice President. Yeah, I guess I should mention that. Gabe Edgar, uh, incoming superintendent. Phil Bamba, board member. Rick Gilmore, board member. Alan Baker, board secretary. And I am uh, <coughs> Terry Clark, uh, president of Grant Clark and Seifert Architects Engineers. I'm Greg Seifert, uh, principal of Creo Clark and Seifert Architects Engineers. Okay, so the first question, are there any previous projects that your firm has worked on that presented unique or special circumstances that are relevant to public K-12 school districts? Well, I think to answer that question, I'd have to say that all of the projects that we do are unique in some way because every, everything is always different. We, we always learn something from virtually every project that we ever do. Uh, things that are probably more relevant to schools, particularly in today's environment, might be things like the whole security issue, accessibility uh, issues, uh, and durability. <clears throat> a lot of times durability becomes a factor of cost. Uh, again, whether it's a building, say, like this, where you have concrete block walls versus some have gone to metal studs and sheetrock, but obviously there's there's an issue there so that becomes a discussion of okay how much money do we have versus uh, what what do we want to do with regard to the issue of uh, maintenance uh, so there's just a lot of things that come up but uh, again like I said every, everything is kind of unique uh, uh, and they do you know there are there are some special circumstances that come up with Virtually everything. Uh, one thing about us is we have the ability with uh, being a firm of 16 uh, architects, engineers, uh, with the, the full capacity of doing civil, architectural, structural, mechanical, electrical, and interior design. Uh, there's just not much that somebody can throw at us that we either haven't seen before or we can't figure out. I know uh, a number of years ago, it's been almost 10 years ago now, when Mosaic approached us to interview with them, they needed to replace uh, their architect. And at that point, we basically told them that, you know, we don't necessarily have a lot of experience in medical, but we do have the, the staff and we do know how to get a hold of the people that do. So the bottom line is, is we've been there for 10 years and have continued an, an excellent relationship with them doing uh, all kinds of things. So I say that only to say that if there's anything that comes up that's new, uh, that none of us have seen before, we know how to educate ourselves, we know how to listen, so we can make sure that we provide the most up-to-date up design of uh, a facility that is possible. Thank you. I think you kind of answered number two, but in your opinion, are there any unique challenges that come along with working for a school district? Maybe you talked a little bit about security or any other things? Yeah, you know, uh, really, really there aren't. Uh, probably if there if there are any challenges, uh, I would say it, it just comes down to uh, possibly a board itself and how they operate. Uh, I'm sure you've all been in situations, you know, the more people that are involved, the harder it is to get a consensus on something. And so 
uh, from that standpoint, uh, we have we have worked with small groups. We have worked with large groups. Ultimately, we can always work it out and uh, and get what it is that you need, what you're asking for, because that's that's our primary goal is going through the process. Uh, our our first thing is to gather information to make sure of what it is that you want so we can provide that. Okay. Thank you. Can you describe your firm's proposal approach to providing services to the district? Yeah, if, if you haven't had a chance, you've got the books in front of you, but if you look on pages 9 and 10 of the booklet that we gave you, it basically kind of gives you a line by line and a fairly detailed explanation of, of each phase of what we do. On page nine there, we talk about the design approach going through programming, schematic design, design development, construction documents, and the actual construction administration. All those are listed there as far as that's really taking it from programming again where we get, <clears throat> we sit down with everyone that's involved. We like to sit down obviously with the school board or if they have a select committee we'll sit with that group. We like to visit with teachers. We like to visit with maintenance people. Everybody that has any input at all on this building or whatever it is that we're doing we want to get that information from them. We'll take that and bring that into a schematic design which is basically a very preliminary layout of a floor plan. The design development just really kind of is through a back and forth process. We develop that floor plan until we get it to where you want it. Once we've got that, we enter into the construction document phase, which is what the complete plans and specifications we put together for the project, put it out for bid, take the bids, administer contracts, and then construction observation is basically us going out periodically to make sure that the project is going per our plans and specs. <coughs> so that's pretty much how we operate. Okay. On the other side there it talks about cost controls, uh, some of the things we do that. Obviously budget is always important so we try to establish that budget uh, right out of the chutes. Uh, and then we, as we work to develop that, then if there's, if there's any issues that's coming up, we have that discussion to say that, you know, hey, based on the direction we're going, we're not going to make that budget. Uh, one of the things that we do is once we get a preliminary layout, we have a 30, third party estimator that we use out of Omaha that will take it and give us a very detailed breakdown of costs. So we're constantly looking at costs as we're developing and we'll go back and forth with him maybe two or three times through the development of that. So we're pretty confident by the time we get to the completed design, we have a project that's going to be within the budget that we said it would be. Are there any upcoming projects that your firm will be working on which will interfere with or take time away from your work for the district if your firm is chosen? Uh, no. It's, it's, it's pretty much as simple as that. Again, with the staff that we have of 16 people covering the full range, we get together uh, weekly. We have discussions of all the projects we're working on, the scheduling of all of those, the scheduling of people it's going to take to complete those. Uh, so, no, we just, we, uh, we really just don't allow conflict. Okay, thank you. Has your firm ever caused the need for revised or new designs? You know, I thought about that. Uh, really, not to the extent that I can think of. There have been a time or two where if a project comes in over budget and we have to value engineer, that sometimes will be some redraw or at least some renegotiation of materials or whatever that might be. But I can tell you that's that's very minimal. And uh, the thing about that is, is, if we've been working toward a budget and we do have we do have an issue come up to where 
our bids come in over budget and we can't do that and we do have to redesign, that ultimately that's all part of the fee because usually our fees are based on a percentage of construction costs. So whatever that end construction cost be, that's, uh, that's what our fee will be based on. On average, how close have you have your estimates of the cost of work on projects been to the actual cost? We did include in the booklet on page 11 is a cost deviation spreadsheet or actually just a breakdown. Uh, we typically strive to be within 2% of the construction budget. Uh, there are a lot of factors that affect that. Some, some of the ones that we have listed uh, came in under, some over, and some over by choice. Sometimes if we beat our, the estimate and it comes in under, somebody says, well, I've got some extra cash, let's spend it. Um, so we, we really strive, and like Terry mentioned, it's, it's top priority of us to be really hit that budget. And that's why we do work with an outside consultant and then check back continually. How does your firm control the cost of the projects? Again, like Terry mentioned, the cost really needs to be established as soon as we get moving. We need to start talking about budget, what we want to do, we start talking about square footage, construction cost, and then once we get really early in the project, programming, schematic design, we start to reach out and get that estimate. We, we have, again, the third party keeps a database of current construction, and that's enormous right now because construction is out of whack. Uh, you guys haven't heard it, I'll be the first to tell you. It's really a tough situation post-pandemic, hopefully. So their database is up to date. He calls us back and says, where did this go? What was the price? What actually happened? So we have a lot of confidence through that that we can keep the cost where it wants to be. And then as we move through the process, if something comes up and we say, this is going to have an impact on budget, we weigh that cost. Is it worth it? Is, is this where we want to go? But Throughout the process, budget has to be a part of the conversation. And uh, how would your firm approach the need to prevent interference with the educational process? This, this actually ties together with the interference and, as far as I'm concerned, the, the job site safety and then safety for staff and students. There's a lot of techniques that we can use that, that tie those two together. Interference in particular would be separation of the job, the workspace. The, if it's a end of a hallway, just physical barriers like fences and, and partitions you can't see through. Again, with interference, the, the other thing would be off hours work. If you're gonna be jackhammering or saw on the floor or something like that, do that when the, the place is not occupied. And as Terry mentioned, We've been architect of record with Mosaic for 10 years now and done a lot of work since 06. we got projects in the ED that uh, it's tw open 24-7. So construction phasing and how you work to move through the project all plays into that. So interference with the, the students is just, it's not acceptable. We're not going to do that. So we'll just have to work together towards those techniques. To spin off of that, safety of the students and staff i'm kind of jumping ahead if that's okay, it's okay. Uh, it, it also is that's why those questions were similar i mean safety um, you've hit the nail on the head as far as background checks of everybody that's on site but again that separation of the workspace just physical barriers and things like that those those really tie together to keep everyone safe both faculty and staff and students how many projects has your firm completed for the school districts for school districts in missouri and what's the scope of these projects? Okay, if you look at this sheet that I gave you, this is kind of a listing of school projects. The ones that are highlighted in green are Missouri projects. Uh, the others are Kansas, Nebraska. At the very end, you can see that total Missouri projects that we've done is 105, total school projects of 177. And those projects range everywhere from minor renovations to major additions, major renovations, uh, again, dealing with uh, accessibility issues on a lot of them with elevators or wheelchair lifts. Uh, 
we did the elevator at Central High School there a number of years ago, uh, as well as some of the elementary schools in the past uh, that we did uh, wheelchair lifts and small elevators. But anyway, that kind of gives you a breakdown, and then it all it also lists, you know, out alongside not only where the project was, but kind of what what we did. Um, Thank you. That's thank you for for uh, providing that. I think we've already covered number ten. So how will you how will your firm handle and make sure that all pre-build government inspections are completed? <clears throat> um, in almost every project we do, we we submit for permitting. That's electronic through the city. Um, if we're doing contract administration, we'll review submittals, shop drawings, everything to make that project move along smoothly, including contracts with with the board and contractors. Um, one of the other things that we stress is scheduled contractor and owner meetings, whether that's with the board or if it's a small group that's working on that, almost weekly or bi-weekly or even monthly as a project moves along to try to get any issues of its submittals or shop drawings or delivery or who knows what, just get those up, up to where we can talk about them. So contractor meetings are another thing that we would, we would really stress that we have those. That's that's really it. Okay, that was number ten. Eleven. That was eleven. I jumped ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> ten, ten. He answered ten with number nine. Yeah. All right. And then, how do you deal with overruns and costs? Um. Hopefully, we don't have any. No, I just I I understand that. But a lot of the costs need to be again talked about and discussed during the design process. Hopefully we don't have anything that's going to arise, but again, post-pandemic, um, there's a lot of products that uh, we need to verify availability, quantities, delivery schedules, and costs, so that wants to be taken care of and properly vetted as we go through that process. Um, as Terry mentioned, uh, value engineering is another thing we can do. If we get to the end and something seems out of whack, we just had a project with a 480 volt electrical panel we just couldn't get. Just they aren't, they aren't going to make one. It was 10 months out. Um, we had to find an alternate solution to that, but that's just one of those things. But we don't experience overruns a lot, and that's just because we really keep our eyes on the prize here. We, we want to make sure that budget is top priority, other than, of course, student safety and the, and the district, that type of thing. But we, we stress that we're going to make sure we can get what we want. A lot of times, working again as a multidiscipline with engineers in, in the house, we can do some construction techniques that are more normal. As soon as you get outside of that realm, then things, uh, they start to just get more difficult and then delivery times and all of that can have an impact. So just typical construction techniques, not to say we can't be creative and create something awesome, but just not doing something that's just so far off the wall that it's going to be tough to perform. One of the other things I might add to that is with regard to overruns, something that came up here the other day made me think that, you know, we always recommend a certain contingency to be plugged into your budget, uh, depending, that will depend on the scope of the project as to what that contingency is. But we had a, we had a project here the other day where the mechanical equipment had been ordered. Uh, the shop drawings had been submitted, we had reviewed and approved, and one Monday morning the manufacturer called up and said we had a meeting last Friday and all of our product that has not been shipped out as of today, there is a so many percent increase, so your equipment will cost you another $16,000. And of course the contractor came back and told me about it and so I said, well, you know, can't do that. I'm not going back to the owner to ask him for that. So we went back to them and the mechanical supplier and they said, that's it. You either pay the extra or you can cancel the order. Well, they were caught between a rock and a hard place because if they canceled the order, then now by the time we go to somebody else, even if we could have got it at a cheaper price, we'd have been well into the construction part and they'd have been into liquidated damages at that point. So 
that was just something that came up that I I have never seen. Usually a company will honor something if it's already on their books, but they don't do that anymore. So again, a reason to have that contingency for something like that that could come up that we have no control of. Is that contingency set by you or is it recommended by you? Is it, is it something that you see as, does that percentage fluctuate because of the economy? No, um, I can tell you generally speaking, of course, and again, it depends on the size of the job, uh -huh. but say uh, maybe a 750 to a million dollar job, I would probably say if it's brand new construction, very little renovation, I'd probably say 5%. If it's all renovation, I'd say 10%. Those are just kind of general rules of thumb that I've gone by and they seem to hold pretty true as far as having enough. Right. Well, that's it for the uh, list of questions. Any board members have any specific questions you would like to ask at this time? Yeah, Mr. Reader, have at it. Hey, Rick, I was just wondering. <laughs> How do you guys handle not being able to find a 480 panel? Uh, in this case, they found one used, they put in actually, and they put in there, and then once the other one showed up, they just swapped it out. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it was actually on the cancer center at Mosaic. So, it, granted, so, the construction. How, how do you do that? <laughs> well, the, the construction period was long enough that the 10 month delivery time for that panel was still inside the time when they had to get the building open. Okay. Yeah. So all the stars kind of had to align right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one other thing is, as far as this, and really, Rick's educated me on this more than anything. This is not a complicated project. This is not out of the ordinary. This is no special requirements. This is a shell building, right? Isn't that what? The, I mean, this is a shell building, right? For this project, yeah. uh, we actually yeah. are not sure. I don't, well, I'm, not yeah. sure, I'm not sure what the <laughs> scope of the project is. Right, was. I think we've got to discuss that. And uh, the way I understood what? it was we're, we're going to outfit it for the machinery that's going to be put in there, but the, the money we have to work with doesn't include buying the machinery. Is right. that right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so right. We'll, we'll, want it, we'll, we'll be able to tell you what kind of equipment we're going to put in there, and then you can design a electrical system, HVAC system, lighting, everything, mm -hmm. and, and we'll probably want to match the architecture at Hilliard's to blend in with it, you know. I don't, I, I'm not, I don't know how other people feel, but I'm not opposed to a metal building type addition. No, that's what I thought you would, you know, so yeah, it up. And and that's, that's why we haven't gotten too specific, because we're not sure on the prices either. It's kind of scary. We're not it's not a secret we're living in a world where it's hard to guess that kind of stuff and so yeah um, our object you know our our purpose today is to try to uh, select a partner and then once that partner selected then we'll talk about use your guys' expertise on you know this is the avenue you should go right now or this is the avenue you should go right now because we're not in the construction business and, uh, but what we'd like to do though is get the biggest building we can for the amount of money, amount of money. That we yeah. have to spend, you know. We're not locked in. I don't think, I, I think we need a lot bigger building than what we've been talking about. Sure. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a pre-engineered building is probably going to fit fit I that need would, yeah. to get the most square footage under roof for the least dollar. At least amount of money. Yeah. Yeah. And a well, metal building, there's nothing wrong with that because I've seen a lot of metal buildings covered with a facade that's visible that you can you can never guess it was a metal building. That is right. It'll last a good 50 years. For and it's a shop. Building. It's a shop. Yeah, that's why it's, 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 it's training on industrial equipment situation. Yeah, no, you're you're right. You know, a metal building with a standing seam roof. Yeah. Uh, you won't have to do anything to it for 50 years. 50 years. That's yeah. right. You can design the electrical system with either SO cable or you know junctions all over the ceiling where you can drop wherever we need equipment and give yeah. us the ability to move things around. Add to and be able to add to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And cord reels or whatever you want. Yeah, just like Absolutely. you mentioned. Yeah. Oversize it now so we can have Absolutely. And we have a lot of experience with pre engineered buildings. Yeah, a a lot. Great. 
Um, we, we actually just did one for Blue Scope Steel, the old Varco Prudence. So we, des we did a pre-engineered building for the pre-engineered building company. So yeah, we have just a ton of experience. Based on what you know, how long would it take for you to complete this project? Well, it's kind of hard to answer again, not really knowing the full scope yeah. of it. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't know how much site work's involved or, or any of the other particulars like the equipment that's going in it. On uh, average, 15,000 square foot building, and let's say it's a metal, metal building, how long would it take? Uh, well, a 15,000 square foot building, just the box, we'd probably have it done within a couple weeks. Yeah, it's it's weeks, not months. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we, we can jump on that. However long it takes for the dirt work and the concrete to cure. It's the guts yeah. that go in it. And that, that's one it's of the, the reasons guts why. guts go in it. Yeah. And the concrete that goes in it. That's one of the reasons why I asked the question in regards to the, the pre build stuff. Because it was brought to my attention that the last Hillier project, and I'm not sure who worked on it, didn't make any difference, but there was some dirt work that had some historic end in. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, do you remember that? I, I, Have you ever I ran into something like that? Yes. So then it put we had to put it on hold for six months because they had to go back to the federal government and figure out go through a different process. And yeah. I just wanted to make sure that we we understand what we're what we're dealing with. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a whole new ball game when you run into that kind of stuff. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. And there's no at risk in this at all. So you give us a, a proposal and something changes, prices go up, there's no, there's no liability or at-risk factor. Is that correct? Well, again, you talk about when you talk about prices going up, you're speaking of construction prices, I assume. Well, like I, like I said, our, ultimately our fee will be based on a percentage of that construction cost. So if you know prices go up, then our our fee would go up with it. <clears throat> prices come down, or we value engineer, our fee goes down. You guys have any questions for us? I don't think any questions. I think I just wanted to say that uh, you know first of all we appreciate the opportunity to. To talk with you all and for you to invite us to come and interview with you. Uh, I think, you know, I, w I was pleased to see that you had made the decision to stay local. Uh, so whichever whichever one you pick, you made the right decision there as far as staying local. However, we do think that we have the advantage uh, because we are a multidiscipline firm. We have everything that you need in-house. So anything that comes up along the way, uh, just like right now, our structural engineers are working with the school district uh, with regard to the people that are doing mechanical work for air conditioning. We're doing all the structural design for them. Something comes up, we can be on a job site within 15 minutes anywhere in town. And we basically provide that service because we come from a background of construction, so we know how contractors are. When they have a question, they need an answer then. They don't need to wait a week or two. And so, again, that was one of the positives that Mosaic saw in us, that we were here, we could provide everything that they needed at a moment's notice, and we've done that for them. So that's why they keep coming back to us. So I just want to say that to, to be sure you understand that we we can do it all. We don't have to bring anyone in from out of town as far as engineers to do mechanical, structural, any of that. So I think that's our our one big positive. Plus we have we have a vast amount of experience in all aspects of construction. Do you still associate Langford for the engineering? Or you have another mechanical engineer? No, when when we need to use someone, uh, we we have used PKMR out of Kansas City. Okay. Uh, but unless 
unless you really get into some kind of specific system that we're not comfortable with, we'll do it in-house. Okay. Yeah. If there is something, if it is a system that we don't feel comfortable with, we would we would bring them in to do the mechanics. But there was some discussion about the, the new school we built out on Cook Road, the HVAC units didn't perform properly, and I'm not sure what the history of that is. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't either. But I, I know I think they were undersized for some of these things. You know, Alan uh, Langford has come to me a few times and wanted to bid some things, and I gave him the opportunity. But quite frankly, he was never competitive with the other people that we've worked with. Yeah. yeah. So we've, I don't think we've ever used them. No, no. We've got lots of opportunities and never have. <clears throat> As Terry mentioned, we work with a lot of sub-consultants. If there's a system we work with, in particular at the hospital, we work with SES engineers out of Omaha. So we're familiar with those relationships and how that works. So we're not opposed to that. And like, like we said, if that's a system that we just aren't comfortable with, VRF, I think, is what that was, variable refrigerant flow in the schools. That's kind that's of a complicated a bad word. system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that's they're a four-letter word. They're, so. a, they're a very touchy system. It's not good. They had, yeah, there's there's a lot of moving parts in that that have to all line up or they, they, they're, they're hard to make work right. Probably one other thing to saddle on to what Terry said is, is, is he mentioned some of the, con, the contractors we work with and you can see that's on the really the last page of our book is our references. And we have the contractors in town, pretty much all of them call us first. And we, we really do very little marketing. Almost all of our, our work is through word of mouth and just repeat customers and clients. And that's the way we like it. We really want to be there for the long haul for you guys and just make your project a success. So we really feel like our references speak for themselves as well. So would you say that if there's someone who you did a job for and they're unsatisfied, that you kind of work to see how you guys can make that better, or what would be the company's practice? We would absolutely work to make that better. We, we've had, I know in my past, it's been 20 years ago, I had a building that uh, it didn't heat and cool very well on the second floor of a pre-engineered building, a renovation. And uh, at no cost, I went in and redesigned that system. They understood completely the insulation was this thick, it just didn't perform. So. We will work to make that right. I, I seriously doubt we have an issue, just based on our experience. It's very few and far between, but we live here. If we we want to make this right, um, if there is anything to make right. That's good to hear. And I'm glad yeah. that you said that. Um, you're glad to hear that we went local, because I think, well, that we're interviewing from someone local, because I think that's really important. Would you say that most of your employees are from here, St. Joe? I think, uh, yeah, everyone. <laughs> most, <laughs> most yeah. Every, I mean, the, the furthest, probably the furthest one away lives over in the Amazonia area. But they're, they're all, they're all local people. I, I learned a long time ago, whenever I was looking to hire people, that I needed to look local. I needed them to be people that wanted to be in St. Joe. Because the ones that weren't local, I basically trained for three years and then they went back home. The ones that want to be here, and that's what we have. All of our staff are people that are from here or want to be here. Yeah. Thank you. That's good to know. Question, uh, what is, I see the listing, what's the biggest job for the biggest job uh, would have been I guess as far as the building, electrical, mechanical, was $45 million. What, what type of job? That was the newest building out at Altec. We've done several, several buildings uh, in the, say, $10, $15 million range. Uh, and again, as you look through that, uh, job we we do an awful lot of work with all of the industry around town and consequently those companies because of the work that we do for you or for them 
they share that with other places. So because of that, we, we end up doing work in multiple states all over the continental United States and Canada. Just for the record, we want to thank our new superintendent for really concentrating and helping keep it going. Yep. Mr. Well, Mark, are you local? Are you a local guy or? I'm from Helena, Missouri. You know where that is? It's close enough to almost <laughs> count. You're from Canada <laughs> County, right? No, actually, I'm, I'm Andrew County. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 that's yeah, yeah. right. But yes, I've I've been. I've never I've never lived more than 15 miles away from St. Joe in my life. Well, we really do appreciate your interest and um, the timeline. We're we're interviewing obviously right now, and then at four o'clock, and then it's going to lead right into the board meeting. So I don't know that we'll have a decision tonight, but we'll have a decision soon. And either way, um, I'll be in contact with you and, and let you know what direction we're going to go. And by the way, why I brought that up is that these gentlemen are the ones uh, over on the older part of town in Corby Street. They're the ones that redid the fire station over there years ago and operate out there. So I think that's pretty cool. That's why I figured you were local somehow because you've been there for a long time now, haven't you? <coughs> We bought, we bought that building in 88. Yeah. 88? Which is awesome for that neighborhood. I, I have a quick Sticks joke. Sticks out like a sore thumb, but it's awesome. For a quick that. joke along those lines is we had a young girl who wanted to be an architect, so she did a job shadow and said, where are you from? And I said, St. Joe. I said, I was born on the next block in the sister's hospital. She said, you've come a long way in life. <laughs> one block. <laughs> I said, good one. Yeah, good. <laughs> so, never thought Yep, 10th and Corby. 10th and Corby. Yeah. yeah, the original horse and carriage stations across the street. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's cool. There's two, actually two fire stations there. Yeah. They're in the cool one, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the other one. looks like a Frank Corby Ride House uh, fire station. Yeah. Yeah, there's you know, the our, our Echoes, at least Echoes. Mm -hmm. It is. It, it is. is Echoes? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you guys have a famous board. building, too. Yeah. An Echoes building. Huh? Yeah. yeah, it was built in 39. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, guys. Nice Appreciate you. you Thank you, guys. Good to see you, Rick. All right, well, thank you for your interest in the uh, St. Joseph School District. We appreciate your guys' time sitting down with us today. We're going to start over here on this end. We'll kind of go around and just identify who we are so you know the audience you're talking to, and we'll kind of go from there. So start with you, Mr. Reader. Kenneth Reader, St. Joseph, Missouri. <laughs> Boy, I'm the vice president. Dave Foster, President. And I'm Gabe Edgar, the incoming superintendent. Phil Vandal, board member. Rick Gilmore, board member. I'm Jeff Ellison with uh, Ellison Ox Architects. I'm Jeremy Proctor with Ellison Ox Architects. So we talked with Gabe a little bit and talked about this being an informal kind of a meeting. So that great, works great for us. We prefer those. Um, we did get the list of questions, and so we'll just kind of run through those and give you our thoughts on those topics that he gave. Um, real quickly, I'll give you a quick background on our firm. Uh, our firm was established in St. Joe in 1910 by an architect named Walter Boshin, uh, who had the firm for a number of years, transitioned to one of his employees, Ray Hirschman. Uh, in uh, the early 60s, my father went to work for Ray uh, out of the carpenter, taught him how to be a draftsman, taught himself to be an architect, Worked his way up in 1974, bought the company. Uh, Ron Oxier joined in 1982 uh, and was with us that time up until this year. He's retired this year. I joined the firm in 1990 and uh, kind of took over the reins when my father passed away in 02. Jeremy's been with us about 27 years mm -hmm. yep. uh, and is a licensed architect now as well. So uh, 
over that time, at least in our 30 years span, uh, and even beyond school projects that were a main portion of what we do. And so we've done school work all over the Northwest Missouri uh, for a long time. And it's a big chunk of what we do. It's not the only thing we do, because when you're an architecture firm in St. Joe, you can't do just one thing and stay busy. So we do a lot of little things, but uh, school work's a bunch of what we do. And some of that you probably saw in our original submittal. Uh, we may hit on a little bit of that as we go through the questions again. And then we've got some other things that we'll leave with you uh, after the presentation, just showing some other school work we've done. But as we look at the information, as we're going through these, if, if I say something that you have a question, just stop me and, and we'll get into the, the weeds on it if we need to. So on these questions, uh, previous projects worked on that presented unique or special circumstances that are relevant to a K-12 school. Well, as we said, we work with a lot of pre uh, K-12 schools. We also work with higher education, Missouri Western, Northwest, Benedictine College. Um, so we're pretty well versed on the things that a school district needs. Uh, I don't know that there's anything that's uh, a special, unique circumstance. There's certainly things about working uh, with a board, working in a school district with uh, administrators at a specific school site, and working with staff at that site and keeping everything coordinated and moving in the same direction, that takes a little bit of effort. And uh, we've been able to do that very well with different districts we've worked with. Um, it takes communication, and it's probably going to be the one word we say the most of today. Uh, communication is the most important thing in any project to make sure that everyone's kind of up to speed, going the same direction at the same time. It helps eliminate surprises or anything comes up later down the road or even during design. Uh, so, if, if you've seen our list of school districts, um, we can, if you have any questions about projects or anything, we can sure answer those. Uh, I don't think we've got that, yeah. Oh, it was not on there? We brought another one here. Is it falling? Yeah, there's ten there. They're collated. I had to, so three sheets. I had to reach one. Did you send something else yet? The only thing that I had was that uh, the three copies that you had sent. Yeah, I think in that we had a listing of some districts in there, but... Okay. Um, you may or may not have got that yourself. So. Yeah. so that sheet that Jeremy's handing out right now is just kind of a recent list of school districts we've worked for. Um, and those range from new construction, renovations, additions, maintenance repair work. Uh, as I said, we're, we kind of work on all the project types that we need to, especially for our school clients. And some of those on there we've been working for for decades. We're pretty proud of the fact that we don't do a lot of marketing. Um, we stay pretty busy with repeat business and referrals, and so we think that's a pretty good testament to the service we're able to provide. Um, so on the questions, uh, that first question was a little bit, uh, runs into the second about unique challenges that come along with work for a school district. You know, working for a construction projects for a school district, one of the things you really need to think about is scheduling especially when you're doing a project in an existing building. And you know, how does that get done and how do we get the work done and keep the school activities going during that construction? We know that the summertime is a very condensed time and we try to do a lot of heavy work if we can schedule. But what happens when we get into the fall and classes start and how do we do that? So scheduling is probably a unique challenge. And we have to take a look at safety and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and just circulation, how do you keep the contractors coming and going and how to keep students coming and going and make that happen. Um, for school districts, budgets are always challenging. Um, we don't have a lot of districts that we work for that come and say, hey, we've got an unlimited supply of money and we want to make this thing look like a uh, mall in Kansas City or KCI uh, terminal. So we usually work pretty hard to squeeze every penny out of every dollar we can, especially for school districts. It's important. Um, and when you're working with public money, we all know, living in this community, that people want to know how you're spending the money. And so that's a very important challenge when you're working with school districts. Uh, when we talk about our approach, um, I think our first thing is it's a team approach. It's collaboration. We think the owner's people are the, are the first team members we want to get involved. Uh, whether it's the board or whether it's a specific building uh, administration, they're the ones that live in the building. They know the most about it. We're not trying to come in and tell them we know exactly what they need. Uh, we need their input. 
And so we spend a lot of time talking to administrators, staff, everyone we can to get the input on whatever that particular project is, whatever the program is. So collaboration from the very beginning is important. And right along with that, again, talk about communication, you've got to be able to work on a project with a team that you feel comfortable having conversations with and, and not being afraid that if you say something, you're gonna hurt someone's feelings or you're gonna say something they don't wanna hear. Uh, that leads to problems down the road. So what we try to do is we try to set up a, a personal, professional relationship with the folks we work with so everyone feels comfortable openly discussing ideas. If we come back on our first draft of an idea and, and the owner doesn't like it or somehow doesn't feel like it's meeting their needs, they should feel comfortable to say, no, that doesn't work. You've got to do this or you've got to do that and we'll change it. And it, it's not going to make us mad. It's not going to be an ego thing for us. But So whoever you work with, you really need to have that comfortable feeling that you can have those conversations. And so that's where the communication begins and it'll carry through even through design uh, and construction. When you have those construction team members on, you have that series of meetings and uh, during construction and you have that communication from the board and from other representatives to make sure everyone's talking openly. Uh, and so it begins right there, it begins with our approach to the project, very important part. And jump in here, Jeremy, if I miss anything. Okay. Uh, upcoming projects that we'll be working on to interfere take time away. Uh, well, we, we're blessed with a pretty good workload. I think everyone is right now. Our industry isn't different than anyone else's. There's a lot of work out there. Um, we have uh, some nice projects in construction that are, are either halfway or more than halfway done. Uh, we've got a school district over Cameron we're working with on their Performing Arts Center and other additions that's kind of wrapping up except for the final phase. Uh, we've got a couple of residence halls going that are 50%, a little over 50% done. Uh, we have a couple of school jobs that we're designing right now. Uh, Mid Buchanan is doing a nice project and Hamilton over at Penny is doing a nice project. So those are in design and that design will wrap up in the next 30 to 45 days. And so you know, if this project hits for us, it would be a great time to just roll that into our next design phase and uh, keep that going. Um, it might, it might uh, parallel a little bit. We're working with uh, Missouri Western and North Central on their SeaTac project, and so that's designed to start it off. It's a little bit ahead of yours, a little bit behind the others. Um, and so this would kind of fall right in line with those. Uh, number five, you asked the question about ever cause a need for revised or new designs. Um, I don't think so. I'm not sure exactly what we're, we're asking there, but I don't think we've ever gotten to a point where we were out there and all of a sudden something happened and we had to start from scratch. Uh, that's where that communication and collaboration, if we start early on, we shouldn't bring you something that is a surprise to you during our design reviews. And so if we're all on board all the way through, uh, that should eliminate that need, I would think. Uh, and so that ties right into estimates and how, and how much it costs. Uh, construction costs are high right now and they're unpredictable. We are figuring about 30% more than we were a year and a half ago, a year ago. Um, and so uh, we know that we do so many of these jobs, educational and commercial, with the contractors in town. So we keep an eye, we're, we're up to date on what prices are, what these bids are coming in at. And so that helps us get the estimates right from the beginning. When we do those estimates, they're usually a little bit high on the front end, just to be conservative. As we work through the design details, we can firm them up a little bit and get a more closer number, and hopefully those are coming down as we go. But we don't want to come in with you on the first design day and say, oh, this is what's going to cost, and then a month or so into the design, like, well, it's going to be more than that. So that's something we don't do. And, and by doing that and working with you through the different steps, our estimates come pretty close. I think most of ours have been under or right on, uh, we have one recently that was a little bit over, but we thought it might be because of the current climate and the prices were coming up, and so the owner had budgeted for that, and so it wasn't a problem when it did come in a little bit higher than what we had hoped. Um, but since then, we're you know we're doing that, we're raising those estimates a little bit. We're having that 30% increase. We have seen some costs starting to flatten out, and we hope that that continues and maybe drops a little bit. If the national economy does what everyone says it's going to do and have some hard times, that likely will slow down the, the market and probably bring down some prices. Um, but certainly, 
that's the way we approach those estimates. And the fact that we're able to work with so many projects locally with the contractors, it gives us a good idea where prices are today. Uh, how do we control those costs? Um, really what we need to look at when we're doing a, a, a school project and the one I'm thinking the ones we're working on right now is as we go into these budgets and we say that the costs are higher now than they were, we want to have a base bid in there that hits all your main priorities and get it into a spot that we are very confident is going to be affordable for our bid. And then if there's a couple other priorities like, boy, if we had enough money, we'd really like to add this on or we'd like that on, then we'll put those in as alternates. And so we can see on bid day, we've got a, a plan we can move forward with. And if our, project, if our numbers come in even better, then we'll add the work on as it goes down. Uh, that is, is, a, is a great way to approach it uh, when you're dealing with uncertain times. Um, the other thing we can do is we can work with you to say, uh, how do we control those costs for finishes? You know, finishes are a lot of, a lot of cost in a project. If you're not looking to make the best looking school in the United States, then we can work with you on some, some materials that are less expensive. If you really want to make a statement, we can do that knowing that we've got to take some of our core budget and put it to where we want to make that statement. You know, that's certainly all up to you. You can imagine the school district we work with in Northwest Missouri, they're not the ones that are trying to make the big splash. And so they're trying to get every dollar out. And so we've been very you know, creative with them and the way we put up buildings uh, to make that money go as far as it can. Um, and I could get into more details on that if, if we want here in just a minute. Um, interference with the education process, I touched on that just a little bit. Uh, usually that is where we have a project going where those kids are going to be and the staff is going to be. We really need to, to set up barriers both physically and for noise and dust and that sort of thing to keep the two groups away from each other. Um, we, it's very important. Um, I think we even talked about it in there a little bit. Uh, background checks can be required. Badges can be required. It's just to what extent you want to go to to make that happen. Uh, we've done from very little to quite a bit on our projects, and so we have experience with that. Uh, the other thing about that is uh, we usually make sure all of our projects have a zero tolerance policy for the workers. If someone, if a worker says something inappropriate, we make sure that whoever he's working for knows that he needs to leave the job and he can't come back. Um, if it happens more than once, then we have a discussion about that particular company maybe needing to leave the job and not come back. So we take that pretty seriously and our owners work with us pretty well on that. Um, but we wanna make sure that uh, we do keep that separation, um, both physically during the day, during those construction activities and uh, when things can happen with verbally or noise and that kind of thing. Um, depending on the project, sometimes we're doing projects that have, uh, we've done projects with precast concrete where we have these huge concrete panels, have to be lifted off a crane and swung into place. If we did a project like that, there's times where we have to close parts of the school for a, a day if it's during the school time to make sure that if something would happen with that crane and it would fall into the building that no one would get hurt. And so all those safety issues during construction and the kind of a means and methods, we'll work with the contractor and the district to make sure we're keeping the, the kids safe and, and not overlapping during the construction process. Let's see, uh, the pre-build and governmental inspections. Uh, on school projects, there aren't a lot of those. Uh, permitting, we'll submit to the city and have city review. Uh, so I'm not sure what other pre-build government inspections we'd have, but certainly we'll work with you through that if, if anything specific comes up. Uh, and then overruns and cost, you know, that's a that's a very important one and uh, can get to be tough when those do show up. Uh, to begin with, we always tell our contractors in the pre-bid, the pre-construction meeting that no additional work can be done without signed change orders from the owner and so no additional work can happen unless the district is signed off on it uh, so how can that happen if something comes up someone could have a question there could be something that they need uh, clarification on and so we would look at that and, and say is this something that really needs to be done uh, is there another way to do it to where we can lessen the cost or reduce the cost altogether um, but working in that collaborative effort with the contractor after they bring up an idea 
uh, usually can get that to be eliminated or mostly eliminated. Uh, there's always something that comes up in a project. Uh, there's never been a perfect project that I know of in the, in the test of time. Uh, so we, we encourage owners to do contingency planning and then have part of your budget set aside for contingency that you hold. Um, this is not something we make a part of the contract. It's, we don't put it on the contractor side. But if you hold back a certain percentage of your budget and something comes up that it was unforeseen or once construction starts and you see something that you want to add to the project or change the project, you have that contingency balance available. If nothing would come up, then that money just stays in your account and we can look at other things to put it to. Um, I might just mention there, when we talk about budgeting, we have that contingency budget, but we would work with you from the very beginning to set a project budget, not just a construction budget. And so the construction budget would be hard costs that the contractor charges you to get the building built. The other part would be soft costs, and those would include things like a contingency budget, a budget for furniture, fixtures, and equipment to buy the equipment you need to put in the building, tables and chairs, anything movable that we don't run through the contractor. Um, there'll be costs during construction for testing and inspections from a third party that's required. That would be budgeted for. Uh, design fees would be in there. Uh, that way, you look at your budget in whole, you keep your arms around it, and you don't get down on bid day and say we had a $10 million project and our bids were $9,999, but gosh, we didn't have anything for the construction period. We didn't have anything for contingency. We didn't have these other curves. So we'll work with you from the beginning to make sure all those costs uh, are there and not create an overrun in the end. Um, so I think that was a very quick way to run through all those questions. Did I miss any of those? I appreciate that. One, uh, just to kind of give you some background uh, on the pre-build government inspections. I asked that question because at Hilliard the last time around, they ran into some uh, federal Indian ground and so uh -huh. they had to take a little different direction and put things behind by about six months. And um, I'm not sure who did that project, but I, Jill had mentioned it to me, so I just thought I would plug that one in there just to make sure that we were prepared going in. Yeah, that, that's a, an unusual thing. Uh -huh. we, we always talk about that and I've heard stories about that. What happens if you start digging a foundation and you see, you know, Indian uh, arrowheads or mm -hmm. artifacts or remains of human bodies or anything? Luckily, we've never had that, but that would be a that would be a surprise. Now, that would be some contingency planning. You know, you set some money aside that that would be a thing well spent on contingency money if that sort of thing came up. What questions do you guys have, uh, board members? On that contingency budget, is that something that if we don't use it, we lose it, or we just have a credit with you, or is that refunded? To the no, district? that stays on your side of the sheet. So okay. you're the only people that control that. Um, and so if it's not used, it's still in your budget. Sure. Now, like if, if this was a bond issue and you and we passed a bond to get this done and we set that aside, there are those requirements of you have to have that money expended in three years, and so that can go toward additional furnishings, additional fixtures, or we get to the bike back into the project and say, We've got a little bit left, maybe we could upgrade our flooring, or maybe we could upgrade some entry lights or something. It can be spent that way. But it's certainly yours, you don't lose it. You know, we really, we're starting out with a 15,000 square foot building, but I think the type of structure we want to build, we're going to try to give these young people an introduction to what manufacturing life is like. And so we're, what we're going to need is a structure to have machine shops, robotics, the welding equipment and, and I don't know what else, you know, electronic diagnostics, things like that, you know, really hands-on type training. And so the bigger the building we can build, the better. And we're, we're going to be situated on the property. It isn't really going to be all that visible, I don't believe. Uh, so we could go with an inexpensive type structure there that's well insulated, well uh, condition space, mm -hmm. you know, and have cable trays that we could have modules you could plug in mm -hmm. whatever you wanted to along the way. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, we could give you the amount of dollars, I guess, that we want to work with and see what the biggest building is that we could build. I think that's the approach that we're talking about going. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good way to, to start at it. 
because when we're talking about controlling those costs and have the building get built, the thing we would never want to do is build more than we need to. So, for example, we used to only build school buildings like this with concrete block walls and, and some beams and a ceiling. And concrete block has gotten very expensive type way to build a building. So we've kind of stayed away from it unless we're doing something that needs that durability. Gyms, for example, so balls are hitting it, kids are kicking it, the whole thing. Then we'll come back and do some masonry. But what that, what that block wall is, it's a structural system. And so if you're going to use it, use it as a structural system and don't double up and put a steel building with block in it because now you've bought two structural systems for building, which makes no sense. So what we've been doing lately is we probably steel buildings are, are pretty reasonable, whether that's a red iron building or a pre-manufactured steel building. And if you don't need the durability, we'll put a lighter gauge infill in there that is more economical. Um, on a building like this, I don't know if it fit in, but the thing comes to mind when we talk about it is if we left some of that structure exposed, if we could, depending on our square footage and our fire protection needs, it's nice to see that structure in a building like this. So the kids that are in there learning the trades can see how buildings go together a little bit and, and might have that discussion while they're in there if they're, some of that's actually exposed. So that might be a good way to look at it too. What's the biggest job you guys? The biggest job we've ever done? Um, well, one of them was uh, the expansion out of the American Family. Um, that's 130,000 square foot addition and we renovated probably about uh, 60 to 70,000 square foot of the existing building um, at that time. This various remodels. Yeah, that was a, and Augustine. Yeah, the science building at Missouri Western. That was another one that we probably did a 60,000 renovation, 60,000 addition, mm -hmm. I think. And then Westerman Hall over at Benedictine. It was, yeah. Again, it was 100. 110, 120,000 yeah. square feet. Um, and so those projects were all renovation and addition, and so they were. There were also projects where we had to keep classes going while we were doubling the size of the building, um, and so those were very complicated. Um, probably the biggest square footage building we ever done was the indoor practice facility the Chiefs use out at Missouri Western. That's probably our larger square foot building, not dollar wise, but square foot wise. What was the biggest dollar? Yeah, probably the single dollar American family, probably mm -hmm. about 20, 22 million. So we'll work on projects that range from, oh, I just did a little uh, bit, a little uh, school remodel classroom for $60,000. But we also have $20 million worth of work going on in, at Cameron School District. So we run a pretty big range of budgets. Um, at any one time, we might have somewhere between 50 and 75 million in the office uh, at one time but certainly not as one project. Was there any, oh, I'm sorry. What's the biggest challenge? I, I'd like you to ask your question too that we asked the last. Yeah. Um, has there ever been a situation where um, someone was unsatisfied with the work and how did you handle that? Like, would you work to um, make sure that they were satisfied? Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think when we start the project, the goal is in the end, we'd like the owner to get what they wanted, the contractor to have made a little bit of money because that's what they're in business for and they've got to make a little bit of money, and that the owner would call us back for another job. And so that we think in that way they'd all be happy in the end. And so we worked very hard to get to that end. Um, I don't know if I could give you a specific example where we had to bend over backwards to make someone happy. Um, well, I think it kind of goes back earlier to Jeff's comments that he made is that, you know, early on we want to have a good line of communication, open communication. So at the end of the project, whenever it's all said and done, every, the, especially the owner, is happy. So we want to make sure that that's the case, and I think that's where the communication probably helps avoid that. And I was really happy to hear that it was established in St. Joe. Mm -hmm. Would you say that most of your employees are from St. Joe? Um, yes, or just right around the area. I live in the Mid Buchanan District now, um, and so We've got a couple that live just in the Savannah district, just outside of town. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we've are we been here. I lived here all my life with my dad and my mom, so. Yeah. But, you know, something I think you should ask is what your fees would be on 
on this, you know, percentage is isn't it a percentage of the cost of the job? Yeah, it would be a percentage of construction cost. And so that might vary a little bit once we know a little bit more about the project on the team we put together. We know we're gonna have mechanical, electrical plumbing, and structural. If there are any specialty consultants that can change the fee a little bit. Um, usually renovation projects tend to be just a touch higher fee than new construction. Uh, so we'd have to see, I don't know what the, if there's a mix of that here, but uh, typically fees are in that 6% range, depending on where we are and uh, the consultants we have to have on the team. But we're flexible with that too. I mean, that would be something we'd negotiate with the district and find out where your budget is, what the scope actually is, and how we can get you the right team put together. Based on what you know about the project, about how long well, I don't know that I have I know enough about the project yet to tell you that. Uh, that was going to be one of our questions back to you is just tell us a little bit more about the project. But um, if it's fairly straightforward for a job, you know, the design can range from uh, four to six months sometimes. Again, depending on what consultants we have to uh, bring in. If we need to do a survey, that can slow things down dramatically right now because those guys are backed up. We've been waiting on some surveys for six months. Um, soil tests, we would take soil borings, likely, unless you have good information. Uh, and so all those upfront things kind of slow that time frame down just a little bit. Sounds like we need to do an archaeological survey. Well, <laughs> we might need to do an environmental, yeah. yeah. All on this building, we probably have just footings, perimeter footings and a slab forward. We wouldn't have an excavation. Yeah, right. yeah, and if we did a, a steel frame building, those loads would be pretty light uh, for the most part, unless we had certain, you know, if we did a bridge crane or something, we'd want to make sure we had those loads accounted for. But um, So, yeah, and, and there may be enough soils information from when that building was built that we wouldn't need to do any more soils testing. That would save the money for the testing and the time to do the testing as well. I mean, if you just think about, like, Altec, for instance, that facility or or gray manufacturing, those, those are the type of facilities that we're hoping to train future generations of workers for. Kind of building well to and so absolutely, if you think about it in terms of what those buildings have in those, the requirements within those, that's essentially what we want it to be. We want those kids to, when they walk in there, like you said, have a really good grasp of exactly the environment they'll be working within. Because again, our hope is in, in our district is we're either we're setting them up for three avenues, or essentially four. They can either be military service, they could just go directly to the workforce, college, which of course Missouri Western or Northwest Missouri State, or into the industrial side of things or the trades. And uh, this Hilliard expansion is is what is our arm to that. So that's that's what the building needs to be able to accommodate is to get these kids ready for that. So hopefully when they graduate, they can, I mean, they can really be a productive member of the workforce right off the bat. Yeah, I, yeah, that's great. I think that's something our community has needed for a long time. So those spaces are likely fairly flexible. Um, so the machinery, some of them may be fixed with some of the more expensive things coming in with CNC machines and things. But they should be flexible on power, so we should provide different voltages in the space so different equipment can be brought in or used at different times. Um, that would be something we'd probably want to spend a little time on to make sure we had flexible enough and useful enough for you. Um, we have had projects where we looked at that, and I think that the engineers maybe have gone a little too far on that and put every voltage known to man in a room when really we know that that's never going to happen. And so if we can do that programming up front and have those conversations about each lab and what they're going to do, then we can tailor those uh, to what's going to happen in there while still giving them some flexibility in those tasks that they're going to be doing. We, so we're kind of programming right now the SeaTac building that Missouri Western and North Central are working on. I think folds into your project fairly nicely. Um, and those are some of the goals they have for that as well. Um, we worked on a project at North Central 10 or 12 years ago or maybe more on their no, Barton, Barton Farm, Farm campus where they did animal science and plant science and those labs were very similar where they needed them to be uh, flexible enough so that kids could come in and get those skills and Jeremy worked on that one. Which is a, a great project. Which kind of spilled over to their uh, programs that they're going to be offering at their Savannah campus that we're currently under construction right now. On They'll have kind of similar things where they have the robotics, welding, you know, when they use, utilize the old uh, car dealership up there. So they, we have some experience in, you know, some of the programming that you're looking at. 
Is that the picture that was a rendering of the group? Yeah, yes. I think so. Yeah. The, At the bottom of that yeah. third page, yeah. Yeah. And is it, were you guys also involved in the Savannah Middle School? Yes, we were. Yeah. That's why we want to saw SMS. Yeah, that's the middle school. Yeah. Any other questions from the board members? You guys have any other specific questions for us? Did that end up being about what you're building up there, though? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's pretty much it. Now the yeah. colors may change a little bit. We've been through the yeah. material it selection. It won't have red on it. <laughs> they, How they many square feet was this? Uh, that was a total of uh, thirty-two thousand square foot for the addition, and about eight thousand square feet of renovation. You said you attached it to another building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the old uh, McCarty Motors okay. dealership. The additions going there to the south and to the west. So basically, all of their what was their lot inventory lot is now become a new building two-story building with parking in the back and some parking in the front and then completely renovating the existing building and so that building there will have the existing building is their kind of their industrial tech side of things and then the addition will have um, kind of combination of that of general studies and all their allied health programs as well Well, we've done uh, the most recent one was on the new elementary Grove. Yep. Um, and then we've done some other work at uh, Benton, the field house down there. Um, I think we did one. Of, I think two of the packages of the bond issue back in. Would have been '06. No, it was earlier yeah. than that. I think it was around 2000. When all of the um, the uh, libraries were redone and some classrooms were added. We had, I think, all the middle schools in that package? We had all the middle schools and like five or six of the elementaries. Yeah. So the kind of the two big bond issues that we've been able to do, that first one did all those renovations and we had probably 50% of that work, I think. And then when the high, when the middle, when Oak Grove and Carden Park were, were done, we did Oak Grove. Mm -hmm. But you subbed out the engineering on the mechanical part. I know there's a little dust up on the mechanical work. Yeah, at that time, time the district wanted, to, they dealt directly with the mechanical, so they were not on our team. Normally, normally they're on our team and are our sub-consultant to us. There was something at that time where they were very specific about a firm they wanted to use, and so that firm contracted directly with the district outside of us. Uh, What's the name of that firm? That was uh, Langford. Langford. Mm -hmm. Okay, and their big problem was that they tried to use this VRO system. Is that the big oh, problem? Size. That was the problem. That okay, so VRO is okay. VRO. It's, uh, it's not okay. We don't want any part of that. Okay, but VRO is okay if it had been done right, Rick, or? That, I don't it's think a that, different system. It's a different I was system talking about two there. different systems, I think. Yeah, I, I don't know. Oh, they didn't have the VRO system mm -hmm. down there? They don't. No. Oh, then what did they use? Oh, Grove doesn't. That, that's a different system. Those, those were just undersized units. Um, I can't remember what it is. It's a it's a refrigerant coolant or whatever, whatever you call those things. And then normally, a, a big undersized project like, like that would uh, fall back. Yeah. Yeah. Since yeah. it wasn't you at all, then it falls back on them. If it's something done wrong and it's very easily provable, I think it was their value interest. engineering. It was, huh? it was some value engineering. Right. It was value. So they still want that company's insurance be able to come back and fix the problem? Or would it be just out of their pocket? Of that well, I'm sure deal? it would be their insurance, yeah. I would think that if it was a big deal, my guess is it would go to their insurance, yeah. I mean, it was hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars to fix it, right? I don't know. I wasn't on the board then, but I know it was a big. It's been a dust up, and the public kind of holds that up. Is here what the, what they did with our money, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but I just want to make it clear you didn't have anything to do with that. Right. Yeah. I'm glad you did. Thank you. Yeah, and we really were never contacted about issues in the building. I don't think. Um, certainly, 
that's another service we provide. After the job is done and you're using it, we're around to answer any questions for the life of the building, basically. As long as we're around, you can call us. We keep all of our project records uh, forever. We don't get rid of any of those. And so 20 years from now, uh, something breaks down and you can't find what it is, you can give us a call. We'll have a cut sheet on it. We'll know where it was bought, who installed it, and we can get you that information as well. But you made a comment that the BRFs are not working for you. Uh, no, it's been it's been quite a challenge, and I think a lot of it has to do with uh, undersized units. Really? You know, I mean, if you have a room that's 800 square foot, and you put a unit on top that covers 500 square foot, that's not not going to work in your real hot days and your real cold days. Yeah. It works okay, uh, you know, between 20 and 20, or you know, 20 and 80. Yeah. But you know, once you get up in the 90s, they have a hard time. Especially whenever we have the classrooms full. Uh, on, pa on paper, it may be sized perfectly, though. That's the thing. But, it, but that's under perfect scenarios sure, with yeah. nobody in the room, and yeah. you know, with the right window coverings on, and you, which you never get. Right. That's like saying your car's going to get 30 miles to the gallon on the window <laughs> sticker. Yeah. Show me one that gets the window <laughs> sticker. Yeah, still, is an engineering thing that was massively wrong. Correct. And the best way to figure out what happened is read the FBI report. People get really carried away. <laughs> the FBI report is people get really carried see away. what exactly happened. It, it with their concern about energy usage, and they try to dial these units in to where it's exactly what it takes, and, and you don't have any cushion there, you know, yeah. where you ought to oversize it. You know, a little bit. Having 100 percent, have 125 percent. Yeah. yeah. But if you oversize too much, though, it actually becomes less efficient. Right. You yeah. know, so yeah. there is a line there. It's yeah. A fine line. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So when you get into that value engineering thing, if you if you get to that point, and you look at you get a contractor on board, and you look at the trade item breakdown and what each kind of different topic costs in a job, that mechanical is usually one of, if not the highest, on a project. And so a lot of times people want to look at that first and say, well, how can we get that number down? That's a big one. And that's usually the wrong way to go. So if, you, if you're trying to control costs after the fact, if you get to that point, that's tempting to do, but it's something that can come back and bite you later. Is Lankford still in business? They are. I think their firm has changed uh, structure a little bit. I think they've merged with another firm since then. I'm not sure they were with them at that time or not. Well, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for your interest. And, uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'll be in touch. All right. Great. Thanks. All right. Thank you.